A decorated war veteran, Senator Tammy Duckworth, has some clear ideas about cleaning up police violence, solutions that could save lives. Check this out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. On the line with us today is Senator Tammy Duckworth, a Democrat from Illinois. Uh, she is an Iraq war veteran, a Purple Heart recipient, the former assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, among the first handful of Army women to actually fly combat missions during Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, during which she was fairly badly wounded. And she has just served with such extraordinary distinction in the, in the United States Senate. Uh, I, I know the citizens of Illinois were, uh, were on WCPT in particular in Chicago, are so happy to have her as a senator. Senator Duckworth, welcome to the program. It's great to have you back on. It's been a while. Um, I, I wonder if you could start out by talking about your thoughts on the current state of of our policing in the United States. This is particularly a big issue in Chicago, but it's increasingly all over the country, even in small town America. Uh, we see police, uh, you know, uh, operating as if they were some sort of occupying force. You, you were part of the military. What, what does this say to you? Well, I think, you know, a lot of the systemic racism that exists in our criminal justice system has always been there. We're just more aware of it now. And I think, thank goodness for the rise of cell phone cameras, because we are now getting evidence of it. Um, so we're not just, you know, uh, trusting uh, folks are saying, hey, I was, I was, you know, it's racial bias, but people are actually able to record video. And, you know, in, in Chicago, uh, I mean, the most famous, of course, is the killing of Laquan McDonald, um, after which I work with uh, then, um, before she became our mayor, um, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, uh, Lori Lightfoot, uh, on my first criminal justice reform legislation, where um, we talked about, you know, really providing training for police forces against um, the systemic bias and system. Um, and so uh, the need for independent investigation of uh, police involved shootings and killings. Um, so, I mean, I think this has existed, but we're just more aware of it now. Um, uh, and, and of course, what's happening is that people are just not going to take it anymore. Um, and I think we're also seeing that uh, there is an increased militarization of our police forces with the transfer of military equipment to police forces. Um, and, and that's problematic as well. I mean, I think some things we certainly should be transferring, but, you know, it, it's become more and more in recent years so that you actually have police forces that have mine resistance uh, vehicles, you know, MRAPs and other pieces of military equipment that were designed for combat uh, against al-Qaeda. Um, and you find them on the streets of our cities and, and our towns. Do you think that uh, undoing Reagan's 1033 program uh, is a piece of the solution? I mean, where, where do we begin with this? Well, I don't think that you undo it. I think that you can modify it. Um, you know, listen, the, 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 the initial uh, instinct for transferring MRAPs and other things were because of terrorists, you know, Atlanta Olympics bombings and, and, and all sorts of, you know, uh, the, the Boston Marathon bombings, you know, the police forces and the SWAT teams, you know, are going to have need of some of this stuff. That was the original intent behind it. But do we really need to transfer uh, machine guns with a caliber um, greater than 50 caliber munitions on them to the police forces. You know, we, we need to start to take a look at some of this. Now, I fully support, you know, being able to transfer body armor. Um, you know, in Illinois, uh, in our rural communities, we have many communities that, uh, uh, you know, um, don't have a lot of funds. And if, we can, if they can obtain body armor um, to protect our, our, our police officers, I think that's a good thing. But do we need, again, you know, uh, high, very high caliber weaponry. Uh, I think twice about that. So I think maybe we need to take a look at modifying it, not necessarily eliminating it. Yeah, the the United States has a uh, a long history of uh, outside of the Civil War, um, and, and and some would argue the you know some of the rebellions during George Washington's presidency, but basically not ever turning. Uh, guns on the civilian populace, the military the, uh, specifically. Um, uh, we saw in, in uh, Lafayette Square a week or so ago, uh, Donald Trump use the National Guard of several different states against peaceful protesters. Uh, Tom Cotton published a piece uh, who I'm, I'm convinced wants to run for president in 2024 on the, on the fascist ticket. Uh, we saw Tom Cotton publish a piece in the New York Times basically saying, no, it should have been the, you know, the, the, the military. It should have been the airborne. Um, 
that uh, it chills me. I mean, wh where are we at with all this? What's the state of posse comitatus? Where, what's the sentiment of the Senate when it comes to things like, you know, the, the president using the military against the people? Well, I will tell you that I'm personally absolutely appalled, and I think most Democratic senators are absolutely appalled um, that the president has done this. And um, if you see from the writings from numerous um, uh, uh, retired generals, whether it's Colin Powell or others, that they too are very much appalled at this abuse of um, the military. You know, the National Guard has training on crowd control and, 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 and that role. Um, you get that training. Active duty forces never, ever have that civil disobedience uh, training on how to properly uh, deal with um, uh, protesters, especially those who are out um, peacefully exercising, you know, the First Amendment rights. Um, and so uh, the active duty forces are absolutely no longer about troops to move in. And I think if we talk to, the, uh, you know, my, uh, my former colleague John Lewis and the others who were part of the civil rights movement, that uh, we had used the military against civilians um, before uh, in the 60s, and that was not a good thing. And we should certainly not return to uh, some of the egregious actions at that time. And, and we have to stand up to this president. Um, you know, I was very disappointed in Secretary Esper, um, you know, because uh, uh, he went along with this uh, ruling from uh, Mr. Barr that the um, Insurrection Act would be something that was appropriate initially. Um, it's not uh, in this case. Yeah. And so um, the military has to stand up and the military leaders have to stand up to this president. You're on the Armed Services Committee in the United States Senate, Senator Duckworth. Uh, do you do you think that it is uh, we're at a point where it's necessary to legislatively constrain or, or, or put some guardrails essentially around the executive branch when it comes to this issue? Well, I hate to have to go there because we should just be in the legislative branch and stop ceding our control over to the president. Uh, under mm. uh, Mitch McConnell, we have just handed over um, uh, uh, our legislative oversight uh, of the executive branch on so many things. You know, you, you, we, we appropriated money for the defense budget and the president took money from the defense budget to go build his border wall. Uh, we don't um, oppose him when it comes to their, uh, their use of the AUMF. And by the way, this is not just a Trump thing. You know, the Obama administration also stretched um, the, the definition of the uh, 2001 and 2002 authorizations for use of military force against Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda to um, expand into, you know, uh, other areas. So uh, the, we just have to um, put our foot down and say, listen, this is our role and we're going to provide oversight. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, the, the Justice Department, which we rely on and the inspectors generals that we rely on to provide oversight uh, are no longer there because this president has fired them all and Mitch McConnell has stacked the courts with ultra conservative judges who are just we're going to be rubber stamps with this president. So, um, yes, I mean, we could do it legislatively, um, but I will tell you that it wouldn't pass. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't pass muster when we can actually do this um, by just um, uh, stressing our constitutional role as a co-equal branch of government. And that's where we should be doing this. If we if we get a Senate majority, a Democratic Senate majority after uh, the, the elections this November on well, January, when you all are you know, sworn back in, um, it, where do we start in, in undoing the damage that this president has done? Well, there's just there's just so much um, that needs to be done. I think that um, we need to start with the. Uh, Justice Department, and um, we need to take a look into some of the decisions that the Justice Department has made. Um, uh, I think we need to, um, you know, uh, make sure to invest power back into the inspectors generals, whether it's through the confirmation process um, and, and making sure that uh, we put into place inspectors generals who will stand up to this president or any future president. Um, and I think that uh, um, uh, there are some legislative fixes that need to happen um, and some you know, some guardrails that do need to um, be explored uh, because uh, we, we've, it, it's just gone far too far. And I don't think our um, founding fathers ever expected, um, and they put in the checks and balances, but they never expected legislative to just hand over our powers to the executive branch. 